All right, if you have your Bible, please turn to 1 Samuel 17 today. We've been in some fairly familiar stories so far. This one is very familiar, but I hope will still be fresh for us this morning. And because it's so familiar, and because it's Wednesday of camp, uh, I'm going to have you guys help me a little bit tell this story. This is the story of David and Goliath. Everyone knows that story, right? Good. Yeah, raise, you just need to move something. There you go. Good, good, great. Okay, everyone knows that story, but I want us to think about it in maybe a way that you haven't before, but we want to do that by kind of working through the details of the text and then reflecting on that story and what it means for us today. So David's the good guy, Goliath's the bad guy, right? David's from Israel, Goliath is one of the... Okay, good. See, you guys have got this. Goliath was about how tall? Yeah, maybe like nine feet, nine inches. He's bigger than the tallest guys here. He would be so dominant uh, on the basketball court, I would imagine, uh, as long as he was quick enough. But it's like, you know, he'd be dunking like down almost. It's incredible to even think about. He was so big that he had his own guy who carried his shield for him. Like usually, you know, you have your weapon, you have your shield. He had a a guy behind the shield walking in front of him because he's that big and that's how big his shield was. His armor weighed 125 pounds. If I was wearing that weighed 125 pounds, I would not be walking back and forth across here right now. The tip of his spear was 15 pounds. And some of you are like, 15 pounds, no big deal. If that was on the end of a stick that I imagine was pretty thick and I needed to stab someone with it, it'd be like, I, 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 some of you guys would be better, I know. But it's heavy. The point is, this guy is huge. If he walked in, if he ducked in the back door right now and started to threaten us, I don't know if there would be enough ants to overtake that grasshopper, if you catch the reference from Bugs Life. Anybody watch Bugs Life? Right? There's more of us than there are of them. We can take them, right? But I just feel like we would all be like little ants getting swatted off of him, just like we swat ants off of us when we get them on us. If he came in and threatened us, the fear would be real, right? Yes, I would be... Very afraid. So it's like, is there anyone here who would fight him? Like, well, I already know he dies at the end. So it's like, no, no, no. Don't don't pretend you know the end of the story. If a guy walks in like that and threatens us, who is standing up? Part of what we're supposed to feel is that... You're carrying a gun, sir? Is that... (laughs) It's like, who's going to stand up? Uh, Is that none of us would. Not one. And that's actually what happens for 40 days of Goliath coming out to threaten Israel's armies. When we're kids, we hear this story, and it's like Goliath got up and said something, and then David said something, and it's like, and it gets there. But for over a month before someone stands up and says, I will fight this guy. No one stands up, which makes a lot of sense to me. I wouldn't stand up either. We would all be afraid. We would all be on the sidelines. But then, David shows up right on God's timeline for him. Why was David there? Why was David there? Yes? Okay, he was delivering things to his brothers. David was there because his father gave him a mission. Now, the mission wasn't kill the giant, but his father said, take these provisions to your brothers and see how they're doing. I know they're at the place where they're supposed to be fighting the Philistines. And so David obeys his father, takes his things to his brothers. Now, is that how his older brother interprets David's action? What does his oldest brother 
you know, the one who wishes that he had been anointed king, what did he have to say to David when David's going like, who's, why are they talking like this? Who's letting him get away with that? Why isn't anybody going to do anything? What's his brother say? Good job. I'm so proud of you, little brother. You go out there and get him. What does he say? Yes. Essentially, essentially, he says, go home, right? It's like, what are you doing here? I know your pride. I know how impetuous you are. You just came out here to see the battle. And David's like, but does anybody care about what's going on? Does anybody hear what this guy is saying as he is defying not just the armies, but the armies of the living God? Does anyone hear what he's saying? Will anyone stand up? And of course, eventually, David is the one who does that. It's a little awkward getting there, right? Word starts to get out. Hey, there's this kid who wants to go and fight the giant. He's going to go do it. Word gets to Saul, and Saul says, hey, come here. I've got some armor for you. Now, how tall is Saul? He's pretty tall. We're told he's like head and shoulders taller than everyone else in the kingdom. So uh, how tall is the tallest guy here? Six what? Okay, 6'4". All right, one of the other guys. Yeah, okay. Okay, so about 6'4". So imagine, you know, you're, the tallest guy here is at the shoulder of Saul, who feels small next to Goliath. Saul, who is supposed to go out and fight the battles for his people, is shaking in his boots too, and hiding in his tent, and not going out to fight for his people. Do you think Saul's armor is going to fit David? No, and it doesn't, right? It's awkward. He says, I haven't tested this. I don't know what to do. I'll do it my own way. Uh, By the way, the Lord has already through me uh, killed lions and bears, and this guy's going to be just like them. But it's not this arrogance that his brother accuses him of, right? It's the Lord has this. The battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. And then, of course, he takes the five smooth stones, which, depending on what kind of sermon you're hearing, might be interpreted as five different ways of defeating the giants in your life. But he only used one. So if you hear a sermon like that, you can just say, please preach me the Bible next time. Kindly, okay? (laughs) All right? So it's not about the five ways that you can overcome your giants. He took the five smooth stones, he put the one in his sling, and as he's running at the giant who's laughing at him, right? What am I, a dog? That you've sent a boy out here with sticks? Come on, right? I'm not in any danger from this guy. David runs at him, slings the stone, it sinks into Goliath's forehead, he falls down. David runs, he doesn't have his own sword, so he takes Goliath's sword, which is huge. You can almost picture this, right? It's like this huge thing, and he's cuts off Goliath's head, and the battle is over. That's almost the true story of David and Goliath. But there's a piece, an important piece, that actually helps us understand how we fit into this story that I left out. What had Goliath been saying every day? When he comes out, he steps apart from the rest of his army, comes down in the middle, says, I'm going to take on all you guys, right? No, what does he say? Anybody know? Yes. Right. Yep, he's blaspheming God. He's defying God, saying, who's going to save you from me? But he's not saying, I'll take all of you guys at once. Or if you're from the south, I'll take all y'all. He says, give me one man and let us fight together. And what kind of fight was it going to be? It was, sure, a fight to the death. But it was a representative fight. right? What did he say? If he defeats me and kills me, then we'll be your slaves. But if I kill him... If I defeat him, then you guys will be our slaves. This is not just like, who's brave enough to fight the giant? And are we brave enough to fight our giants? 
It's this scary, huge, strong warrior saying, give me one, and if I can take him, I'm going to have all of you guys. But if he can take me, then you guys win. And that's exactly what ends up happening. Because the end of the story isn't Goliath's head getting cut off. How does the rest of that day go as you read the last few verses of 1 Samuel 17? Right? When they see that their champion, that's a key word here, when they see that their champion is dead, they run. Why do they run? Because they know they have lost the battle. It's not just like, oh, our big guy died, we're so sad. They knew what the terms were. They knew what the deal was. And so did the army of Israel. And so the the story doesn't end with David standing over Goliath. It ends with the army of the Lord, the army of Israel, the armies of God, going after and defeating their longtime enemies, the Philistines. Now, we have a parallel for this in our culture today. Um, We don't have any recent uh, championship teams in Philadelphia. I guess you go back a few years ago. Okay, so how many of you are from Pennsylvania again? All right, how many of you are from the parts of Pennsylvania where you care about the Eagles? Okay. Okay, so, uh, you know, the penalty in the last minute was very unfortunate and painful this year. But, you guys remember, you guys are all old enough. See, if I do this in elementary chapel, they just look at me like, who's Nick Foles? <laughs> right, it's sad. But we're, we're old enough in this room that if you know anything about the Eagles, you know that several years ago, they in fact did win the Super Bowl. And some would say that they uh, overcame an evil uh, champion on the way. And what happened, for those of you who are Eagles fans, and for those of you who aren't, think of whatever team you've cheered for, if you cheer for teams at all, who have ever won. On that night, when the game was finally over, when that last pass fell incomplete, as you jumped into the arms of the people around you, you said, we won. Have you ever thrown a pass for the Eagles? Have you ever taken a snap at quarterback and even just handed it off for the Eagles? Have you lined up across from Goliath (laughs) on the offensive line for the Eagles? No. But I would say you were not wrong on that night when you said, we won. And what did they say at the parade? We can't say all the things that Jason Kelsey said. (laughs) Let the hearer understand. But what did they say? We love our city. This is for our city. And man, it was a great time to be in Philadelphia. It was awesome, right? The whole city had this lift. We were all nice to each other for like a week. (laughs) For real. The same thing happened when the Phillies won in 2008. You guys don't remember that one. That was also epic. And if you're wearing anything red, even if it didn't have anything to do with the Phillies, you'd see somebody who's like, hey, hey, yeah. You know, and the next week we're kind of like back back to normal. But for that little bit, right, We won. And if we're sticklers about it, well, you didn't do anything. But, man, we felt like we won. We're going to celebrate it the rest of our lives. Hopefully we'll have other ones to celebrate too. (laughs) But it's something they'll always be able to look back on and go like, when this guy stepped up and did that, when no one else could step up, Nick Foles was there. And he got the job done. And we won. Being able to understand that helps us understand the story of David and Goliath in a different way. 
Because probably when you were a kid, you read this story or heard this story, and you think, okay, I have giants in my life. And I can overcome them. And I can do it. And I can be brave like David. And I can trust the Lord like David. And, and yes, you can. But the reason that you can be brave like David, the reason that you can trust the Lord like David and count on Him to come through right on time is because there's another champion who like David showed up when everyone else was cowering, shaking in their boots, afraid to fight, knowing they would lose if they fought, because that's what we would all do if we tried to fight sin, death, and Satan on our own. We would all fail. We all already have. But we have a champion. And he won the battle for us. David was from which tribe? Judah. Right? That's the one back in Genesis 49. The scepter will not depart from Judah. And David later in his life is going to get a promise from the Lord that one of your sons is going to sit on the throne forever. See, the first way we know that we're different from David and not supposed to just be like, hey, I'm David. I'm supposed to be like David. Is that as far as I know, none of you have been anointed king of Israel. If you have, I'd love to talk with you (laughs) afterwards. That's not our story, but that's what had happened to David back in chapter 16. He already knows he is supposed to be one day God's anointed, the Lord's anointed. And the fancy Old Testament word for that is Messiah. The New Testament word for that is Christ. And I'm sure all of you already knew that. But whenever you hear that expression together, Jesus Christ. Christ is a title. Jesus, the Messiah. Every Israelite who heard that word, everyone who had been waiting for someone to finally come and fight their battles for them and win and set them free. When they heard that word Messiah, when they heard that word Christ, they were thinking of the Lord's anointed. The one who had been promised a long time ago and would set them free. And at just the right time, Christ, in our key verse from Romans 5-6, died for the ungodly. The Messiah, the anointed one, who was sent on a different kind of mission than David, but he was sent on a mission by his father. He was in the right place at the right time, even though it all seemed to go wrong when he died on the cross. But we know that through his death, he defeated death and freed those who their whole life had been subject to to lifelong slavery. That's how the author of Hebrews interprets Jesus' work on the cross for us. That in His death, He defeated death and freed from the power of death those who had been slaves their whole lives. So the story of David and Goliath is not first or mainly a story of how you're brave enough you can beat your giants just like David beat Goliath. It's about how the Lord's anointed defeats God's enemy on behalf of the people and now they share in His victory. So we do still have a part to play. We trust the Lord. We see that our captain, our champion has already gone out and has already defeated the enemy. And now we, as His people who trust in Him, trust in His sacrifice, trust in His victory, now we share in His victory because we have indeed been set free. Just like the armies of Israel ran to the battle that day. We've already won. Let's go. We have already won. Now we don't yet see everything under His feet. But we have the promise that one day everything will be. Now, it doesn't mean that everything will go right in this life. It doesn't mean everyone you try to tell about Jesus will say, I've been waiting for someone just like you and I had a dream last night of someone who looked like you who was going to tell me about Jesus and I fall down on my knees and repent. For those of you who have ever made any attempts to tell someone else about Jesus, you know that's not typically uh, how that goes. 
right? Or when you decide, okay, that sin that I know that I struggle with, I'm really going to get it today, you know, and you just like fall on your face right away. I do that still. So I assume that one or two of you have that issue as well. We still have work to do. They're still fighting ahead, but it is not in our own strength and the battle is already won. The battle, as we're told here a couple times, is the Lord's. It belongs to the Lord. He has already fought and won it in Christ. And we participate in His victory. And so the first question is, are you trusting in Christ alone for your salvation? Or do you think, if I work just a little harder, just a little longer, or if I can just be good from this point on once I decide I'm going to do better, that finally God will be pleased with me? It doesn't work that way. Every one of us falls short. Every one of us has sinned. And we are not David. David wasn't perfect either. Just like we had a whole lot of do not recommends the last couple days, there's a lot of do not recommends in David's life too. But there are no do not recommends in Jesus' life. He always did what was right. He always obeyed the will of His Father. He always loved God and loved His neighbor as He ought. And He loved God and His neighbor and obeyed God all the way to the death of the cross for us. For you, for me. And the first way we join in His victory is by realizing that we cannot win the battle on our own. That we cannot be good enough. Not a one of us. But He gave His life so that everyone who trusts in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. So are you trusting in Christ alone? Not Christ and I'm a pretty good kid. Not Christ and I'm from a good family though. Not Christ and but we've, you know, we've kind of always believed in God and tried to be good. Are you trusting in Christ alone? And then for those of you who are trusting in Christ alone, alone. That's how you live your Christian life too. He has won the battle and now you simply run along behind Him. And He is with you by His Spirit empowering you to obey for real. To make sacrifices for real. To love others when it's hard and impractical and annoying. Jesus crushed the head of the serpent for us. He did what we could never do for ourselves. So today as we go through camp life, let us be grateful for our champion. Let us trust in his work. Let us exalt in his work. Let us celebrate that he has given us life through his life, death, and resurrection. And let us join in his victory by His grace, and for His glory. Let's pray. God, thank You that by trusting in the victory of Christ, we have life both now and forever. Would You help each one who's gathered here this morning to know saving faith in our great champion? And would You help each one knowing Christ, being united to Christ by faith, to go out with confidence, not in ourselves, but in Christ, the Anointed One who has fought the battle for us, will fight the battle with us, and will be with us to the end. We thank You. We love You. We trust You. In Jesus' name, Amen.